Hi guys, the latest video is with Tom Williams. He's the author of the book, Do You Speak Football? Which is something of a maxi glossary of all the weird and wonderful terms that are used across the world in the beautiful game. I've now figured out how to work YouTube so the comment section is no longer disabled on all of my videos. It turns out all I had to do was actually click the button, no, it is not suitable for kids, which is probably a good thing given that during the course of our conversation, uh, Tom randomly brought up a tangent about irreputable massage parlours. I'll let you discover all of that and more. Please give me your thoughts on the video, of course, by clicking the uh, thumbs up to give it a like, by commenting so that we can have a bit more engagement, and I look forward to reading all of those. And if you enjoy my content and want notifications as to when I'm next publishing a video, click the notification bell. All right, here we go. Enjoy it. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for joining me. I'm now going to um, quote Alan Partridge, as I often do, because your book here, Do You Speak Football?, is to paraphrase Partridge, it's like the Quran for the football <laughs> football and language enthusiast that I am. Um, Tom, this must have been a Herculean effort in terms of research and sort of the time that you went, that you put into this pouring over source material and things. Um, talk me through how the book came about. So it goes back to start of 2016 um, when Jonathan Wilson, editor of the Blizzard, um, was asking me to write something for the Blizzard because I used to go out on their sort of um, their end of year night out and things like that and sort of enjoy the fruits of the Blizzard uh, corporate credit card. But up to that point, I hadn't <laughs> written a single thing for the Blizzard and, and Jonathan had been on at me for a while to come up with an idea. And it, it, I, I had the idea of of writing a glossary of French football terminology uh, to coincide with Euro 2016, which of course was hosted by France. Um, and that was a really enjoyable exercise. Didn't involve that much research because I'd spent four years living in France and writing about French football. So I kind of absorbed all this language. And, and for me, the, the, the linguistic element of it was one of the things that I enjoyed the most. Uh, and I think anyone who um, who speaks uh, another language uh, and, and is able to follow football in that language will know um, what a brilliant way that is for kind of expanding your horizons and, and making you think about football in different ways. And um, I think one of the things that, that struck me about reading about football in French and watching French TV coverage of football was just the existence of all these all these terms um, that just didn't have equivalents in English. And you think, oh, you know, they've got a name for that thing that we just don't have a name for in English. And that sort of, that piques your curiosity. And the more you look into it, the more stuff you find. Um, and so writing writing the book was, was like that, but just on this sort of much grander scale. So um, I was contacted by a literary agent uh, on the back of the article that I wrote for the Blizzard. Uh, and she said that she knew um, of a, a publisher who were looking for someone to write a global version of the, so I'm gesturing in this direction because I've got the book here. There it is, Exhibit A, I love it. Uh, just in case I need to dip into it to refresh my memory. Um, she, so she put me in touch with Bloomsbury, who ended up publishing the book, um, and I had a couple of meetings with them, and they all went really well, uh, and I, I think we were we were on the same page in terms of um, how we wanted to go about the book, because I think that it would have been possible to do a more sort of knockabout version of the book that was perhaps more focused on the sort of silly side of football vocab. And I, I wanted to do something with a little bit more weight to it without getting completely carried away with myself, but something that, you know, would sort of stand up um, to a, you know, to a degree of intellectual scrutiny, I suppose. Um, and that was it. And I went away and, and wrote it. And um, I'd say the whole thing, it was probably uh, just over a year, maybe a year and a half um, from sort of signing the contract to actually seeing the book come out. And yeah, I mean, a complete labour of love. Uh, and I, I, I wrote it at a time when I was still uh, in full time employment at AFP, my previous company. So I was really having to try and find time to do it. But I enjoyed it so much that it never felt like a chore. You know, if I came home from work and I was a bit knackered, the thought of having to sit at my desk and work at the book for a few hours actually gave me, you know, a, a, a new burst of energy. It wasn't ever anything that I sort of found myself dragging my feet over. Um, 
and uh, yeah, you know, something that that gave me a, a great deal of pleasure to work on that enabled me to to meet well to meet. I mean, most of it was done online and you know over the phone, over email, things like that. But put me in touch with all sorts of different people, uh, and yeah, it, it was a real collaborative effort because I, you know I am quite open about this in in the book. But I the only other language that I speak apart from English is is French. I speak a tiny little bit of Portuguese and. You know, you'll know yourself, you know, professionally, it, it, talking about football, writing about football in a language that is not your own is a very fraught exercise because people uh, have such a, a close relationship with football. And, and I, I find if someone uses an English football idiom slightly clumsily or in, in, in not quite the wrong context, you do sort of recoil. Um, and I was very conscious that, you know, writing about all these languages that I didn't speak at the time and still don't speak now, you know, I, I was opening myself up to, um, you know, the, the, the fact that I, I, I didn't master any of these languages. So it, uh, it, was important, it was important for me to, you know, to get as many people involved in it as possible. Um, and um, yeah, you know, I, I think looking back now, I mean, the book came out a couple of years ago, two years ago. Uh, in a couple of days' time, actually, uh, and I think it's you know I think it's it's aged reasonably well. Recoil, I, I maybe wouldn't have used such a such a strong term, but it's true. I mean, how much do you think there? How many of the terms in the book? I mean, roughly speaking, do you think we sort of stray into that territory of football cliché? I look at the English ones in there, and I think you've got on the cover, you've got something about a wet Wednesday night in in Stoke. A lot of them are, are genuine terms, I've noticed, and I've obviously stuck to my own expertise, French and Italian in particular, I cast my eye over the Portuguese, and I found that a lot of those are, are genuinely used, be it in newspaper articles or commentary, whereas I found some of the English ones, I don't know if you took a sort of more tongue-in-cheek approach to the English, or, or were you just trying to have a bit of a, a, a bit of variety in there? be the case that I deliberately try to be a bit more playful in the English section because this is a book that was that was primarily published in the UK and so I wanted people to find something in the English section that that would um, that would that would uh, sort of grab their interest in a different sort of way because you know for a lot of people coming to the book they they might not have had any knowledge of the language the football language of France or the Netherlands or you know Japan or whatever so you present them with a term and they just won't have seen it before. And that is a discovery in, in and of itself. You don't need to add all that much to it. Um, whereas the language of, of um, British football uh, will would have been much more familiar to them. Um, so that that might account for some of that, uh, some of the choice of language in, in, in the England section of the book. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it's funny, football cliches um, and the extent to which they govern the way that we talk about football and, and I think you know a, a cliche only becomes a cliche because it has a kind of fundamental truth to it you know we, we only we only sort of develop these linguistic shortcuts because um, they're part of a shared language that everyone understands and it, it's only when you step back uh, and, and, and look at the football language in your own country in a sort of dispassionate way that that you actually start to see um the kind of the colorfulness of, of the vocab and, and i i found this in when it came to writing the the england section of the book there were an awful lot of terms that i was very familiar with that i use myself um that you hear in tv commentary that you that you read in the newspaper or whatever and you never actually stop to think about what they mean and how they have acquired their meaning um, and and how how poetic some of them are, how lyrical some of them are, um, but they I guess they get dulled by overuse, uh, and it's only you know you, you think about something like I don't know, uh, a, a squad being down to the bare bones. You say that all the time, you know, um, and actually that's quite a that's quite a, you know as a visual metaphor, it's quite striking, it's quite sort of Dickensian, um, but these you know these terms get used so routinely that you're almost sort of like dulled to the impact of, of the word. So hopefully that, you know, that was something that I wanted to come across in, in the England section. And as you say, I mean, I, you know, I think, in, I think in, um, in a lot of the other sections of the book, there are terms that to, to Anglophone eyes will seem very sort of quirky and strange and curious, but 
um, for people who, who speak those languages, from people from those countries, they'll seem every bit as routine as um, English football speak seems to, you know, Anglophone football fans. Absolutely. Let's let's get into some of the nitty gritty and some of the actual examples. So, uh, I love how the goalkeeping howler seems to tend towards animal terminology. You know, in Portuguese you've got frango, which is chicken, and in, in Italian you've got papera, which is a duck. Um, in fact, on Italian TV, their their equivalent of of you being framed is called paperissima, which is uh, sort of like uh, duckalicious, I guess you'd call that. But um, and then I noticed on the front of the cover, this, um, hang on, I'm going to check my notes here, Fliegenfinger, um, German, the one, of, like the bird who flaps. It's quite interesting, isn't it? I think if they were to make um, like a football version of um, Space Jam, I can't imagine them putting a sort of, uh, some sort of avian figure in goal. Why do you think it is that there are birds that, in particular that seem to be the goalkeeping howler, just because they move sort of ungainly? I guess it's just to do with flapping your, flapping your, arms isn't it really um and if you you sort of take that on a very sort of basic level if you know if any footballer could be compared to a bird it would be a goalkeeper because they spend all their time in the goal now you know well, especially doing... jorge campos with those massive sleeves back in the day as well maybe that's where it came from okay yeah, it's all making sense i think it also speaks to the sort of fundamental otherness of the goalkeeper you know a goalkeeper is such a unique position a goalkeeper plays a different sport to everyone else on a football team um, and so I think it's it's probably not that surprising that um, that they're described in in those ways I mean you think even you know the way that we describe uh, you know you might describe a particularly agile goalkeeper as having cat-like reflexes that's something we do in English as well and I think it just I think it shows that um, you know on the one hand it, like psychologically, a goalkeeper plays a very different sort of role, so much more exposed than anyone else on the pitch, so much more vulnerable. Um, and, uh, you know, consequently, it, it's a position that, that demands a certain mindset. And from there, you get the old cliche about, you know, crazy goalkeepers, but also just physically the way a goalkeeper moves, the sorts of skills a goalkeeper needs. They are so different and so unique to a goalkeeper. So, I, yeah, I think there's probably... There is some sense in it in, in goalies being being compared to animals and, and birds and that sort of thing. What really struck me about your book was how certain facets of football, certain situations seem to have a specific idiomatic equivalent in every language. And the one that, that hit me in particular was when someone strikes into the top corner, presumably because it's a sort of the ultimate thing that you can do in football but um i found it quite interesting because you know american upper 90 some of the kids are using top bins these days as well aren't they yeah and um you've got the i always thought of it as the skylight but you had it as the dormer window la lucarne in uh, in french as well why do you think that can you can you give me some more examples off the top of your head so i don't want you to try and i don't know how much of this you've actually absorbed there are so many i mean like so in in brazil it's uh, where the owl sleeps um, in Spain and in, in a lot of Spanish-speaking countries, uh, they they refer to the top corner as where the, the spiders nest. <laughs> uh, I think in the Czech Republic, it's the gallows. Um, and you're right, you find it everywhere. And I think it's just because, and again, you know, a goal into the top corner is worth no more than a goal scored in any other part of the goal. But aesthetically, it's so satisfying. And that's why so many of the most famous goals that have ever been scored in football history were top corner goals because it just there's just something very satisfying about the ball hitting that that precise area of the goal um, and I must admit you know when I started researching the book I didn't realize that it would prove to be such a universal term but I, I, I found that it was it was one of the most common sort of universal terms that there that there is in football you know that the top corner um, and I think it's because because seeing the ball land in the top corner creates such a sense of, you know, of, of satisfaction. It, it's, you know, it's something that almost like demands its own little, you know, set of vocab. Um, and yeah, you know, I think top bins is, is a great example of, you know, a relatively new football term. Uh, you know, I, I don't think you would have heard top bins being used with anything like the same frequency 
you know, even as recently as 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, but it has really gained currency. And it's the sort of thing that, you know, young players now, when you see a player being interviewed after a, a game in which they've scored a goal into the top corner, they will invariably describe it as having been top bins. Um, and, and then you, and, and you, you know, you see an element of football language taking root more and more. And I, I love, I love that. And I, uh, you know, when I was writing the book every now and again, I would find um, a term with a really, um, uh, a really uh, clear and easy to pinpoint origin story. You know, this term entered the language of this country on this day because this person said it in this context and then everyone else took it on. Um, and I don't think I don't think top bins can be attributed to any one person, but it's certainly something that, you know, if you were to do a kind of graph of the usage of top bins, we would be on an exponential curve <laughs> right now because it is it's one of those one of those terms that's really gained currency in the last few years. Yeah, and it falls under the umbrella term of worldy, I think, doesn't it, the top bins. Um, it's interesting you mentioning there about how certain, be it journalists or commentators or perhaps even players themselves, have coined terms that have then just stuck there. I mean, we have a commentator in Italy, Sandro Piccinini. I love the fact that you included Shabolata Morbida. <laughs> Which is just, um, it's bizarre. And even if you're, um, if you're in the early stages of learning Italian, I, I don't think you'd really know what that is. Um, I think you described it as a sort of um, a soft sabre cut or something like that, wasn't it? Um, that's brilliant. And then, um, and just other players that have done things, you know, Penenka, which obviously is, is the spoon over here. It's uh, Kukiaia, which is more synonymous, synonymous with, um, with, with Totti. Um, Gianni Brera in Italy must have come up with, with a lot. Was he, did he feature heavily in the book? Yeah, he did. Um, and I think what you get with, with Brera is this meeting of uh, football language and football ideology because Brera ultimately became one of the the fathers of Catanaccio because he he was he was close friends with Nereo Rocco the former uh, AC Milan coach um, who was one of the founding fathers of Catanaccio and I think what what Italian football found in Brera was not just someone who was you know very eloquent very creative in terms of the way he used language and, and the way he thought about football, but someone who ideologically um, just felt uh, a very natural affinity for Catanaccio as a way of playing the game. And, and I think that the way he saw it was that Italian football, and it, you know, it, it kind of, it reflects a lot of his own beliefs about Italian sport and Italian society. He felt that Italian men could not compete on, on an athletic level with, with uh, athletes from other countries. Uh, and so consequently, there was a need for Italian football to evolve different characteristics, to find a way of playing that didn't depend on physicality and athleticism. Um, and in his eyes, that's what Catanaccio was. This was a way that Italian football could use, you know, wiliness and tactical discipline and that sort of thing to its advantage um, and, and beat teams that were, you know, naturally more athletic. And I think you can draw a comparison there with uh, Tiki Taka uh, in Spain, uh, because Tiki Taka was, you know, initially seen as a way for Spanish football to make up um, a similar kind of athletic shortfall. Because if you look at, you look at, you know, how the the, the landscape of uh, world football looked in the early noughties, it was becoming increasingly athletic, increasingly fast, and, and it seemed to favour uh, fast, powerful footballers and fast, powerful football teams. And, and, and Tiki Taka was a way for Spanish football to completely subvert that uh, in a way that played to their strengths. And, and, and that's what that's what Catanaccio was to Italian football. And, and I think, you know, Brera, for example, I mean, Libero, that was one of his... Mm. Uh, you know, a, a term that you still hear used today. And 
Um, it's yeah, you, I think particularly in the first half of the 20th century, you, you found in certain countries, particularly influential football writers or, or maybe radio commentators um, would play a really important role in shaping the, the, the football language of a country um, because the game was still in its relative infancy, certainly in terms of professionalism. You had this massive audience that could only consume football in one or two ways. It was the wireless or it was, you know, the sports the sports pages. Um, and so, you know, guys like Brera or some of the great old Brazilian radio commentators of the sort of, the, you know, the, the 40s and 50s, they had this ability um, to to come up with terms that really that really took hold. And I think even now, um, you know, the, the idea that all Italian teams are very defensive is so outdated. But it 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 was such a um, it was such a sort of well rounded um, concept, you know, catenaccio and everything that went with it. it. It's how an awful lot of people still think about Italian football and will think about Italian football, you know, as, as, as long as they live. You look at like old pros these days who are asked about Italian football, a player who's come from Serie A. That's still what they sort of hark back to. Um, and, and part of that is because the language is so well established and so evocative and so well known. And it's interesting how those terms then almost the style of play might become outmoded or anachronistic and then the terms suddenly become disparaging. You know, people actually used tiki taka ultimately, didn't they, as a rod with which to hit Guardiola as that sort of sterile possession just for possession's sake. Similar with catenaccio. It's almost like a swear word now. If if you use that, it's, you know, the sort of the height of of negativity. Um, but I want to bring you on to French because um, I know you spent a lot of time in France and obviously worked for, for AFP as, as you mentioned as well. F French has some has some great ones, doesn't it? The, the one that came to mind this morning was um, Lord up, you know, when a team sort of uh, steals the points really. And I was trying to think of an equivalent and I thought of daylight robbery and I thought, no, that's not that. It's the sort of thing a Cockney would say, isn't it? If they, they think something's overpriced. I think it's more smash and grab, isn't it? Smash and grab will be the closest equivalent. And I mean, there are, and this is the sort of thing, I guess, as a, as a British person reading about French football, those, um, you know, inelegantly appropriated anglicisms do sort of leap off the page. Um, you get a lot of, um, you get a lot of words like uh, le coaching is one. Mm -hmm. Uh, the coaching, which generally is only ever used to mean substitutions. So if a, if if a coach makes some good substitutions, it's bon coaching. And if and if you know things go things go you know wrong, he, he brings on a sub who doesn't have any impact, then it's you know move coaching. And then you you know words like feeding as well, um, which you see quite a lot. One that always amuses me, and this is not a football specific thing, but it's something that I read in an awful lot of French football articles, is happy end. And yes. <laughs> It's, it's unfortunate, yeah. We're hoping for unhappy end, and it's. I mean, I think on the one hand, it's it's inaccurate because you wouldn't say a happy end; you'd say a happy ending. But it also makes you think of you know sort of dubious practices in um, in the various massage parlours, uh, absolutely. <laughs> which is another uh, unfortunate uh, unfortunate mental image to have. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you say, the language of French football is, is extremely rich. And I think because it was, you know, it, the first language other than English that I uh, experienced football through. Uh, and to this day, you know, the, the only language that I, I speak, uh, you know, at any sort of decent level, I, I do have a great affection for the language of French football. And I think it, it opened my eyes in lots of ways, particularly in terms of, um, you know, technical terminology. And there's a term that I often go back to, um, which I first encountered in, in in the context of French football, which was uh, grand pont, mm. the, the big brother of petit pont, which is of course the nutmeg. Uh, and uh, a grand pont is when a player knocks the ball past his opponent on one side and then runs around him on the other side to, to get it back. And it's a move that you see in every single football match you ever watch. And yet it doesn't have a name in English. It's astonishing. I think it's it's more of a playground move, isn't it? Traditionally, you know, it was always the quick kid at school that maybe didn't even need much pace. You knock it to one side and then run it round the other. It's sort of um, early Theo Walcott sort of uh, skill. But it's so interesting you say that because I've never found a good 
solution for that. Thankfully, it doesn't ever really come up in, in press conferences. Um, and a colleague of mine, recently an Italian colleague, wrote to me and said, how do you say grand pont? And I thought to myself, you don't. You have to try and explain it. And he said, well, if I use it in Italian, more people understand. I said, I don't, don't think they will. It's astonishing that, isn't it? As you said, it's a move that you, you will frequently see. Yeah, well, in, in Spanish, it's, it's uh, auto uh, like a self-pass, which I think is probably, you know, that's something that we could quite easily use in English. Uh, and, you know, I guess the fact that we've, we've gone as far as we have in English without needing a name for this means that perhaps we don't need one. But that, that was one example that alerted me to the fact that there were gaps in the football language that I'd kind of grown up in that I wasn't really conscious of. Uh, and then, you know, the more you read about football in different languages and the more you look into it the more you come across you know these examples and I think it I think ultimately it, it kind of it, it points to the fundamental conservatism at the heart of um, you know British football traditionally that I think as as the country that that you know invented modern football as a, as the country that codified modern football and sort of as the you know the country that came up with all the the, the building blocks of of football language which were then you know sort of exported all around the world i think there was a feeling that you know we didn't need to come up with names for other things that you know there were there were superfluous parts of the game that weren't important so they just weren't ever named uh, and the fact that you still have terms to this day that, that don't have uh widely used uh, english names i think it's just an example of that yeah, uh, Rabona comes to mind, you know, that we're now appropriating foreign terms. Interestingly, we don't seem to use Trivela, which is that outside of the boot strike, isn't it? Sort of, we can't look where Ezra tends to do that a lot. I had some real nostalgia this morning reading through the, rereading through the chapter on Italian because uh, there was the term Melina in there, which is, um, I guess you translate it, Mela is an apple, so I guess it's a diminutive of that, really. And um, I have never heard that. You know, I've been living in, in Italy now this time around since 2013 on off. I don't think I've ever really heard Melina in a footballing context. I've tried to crowbar it into conversations to see people's reactions. But the first time I heard that was in my first year of university. I was playing for UCL and uh, my coach was uh, an Argentine Italian and he used it to death, that expression. We had one Italian speaker, which wasn't me at the time, on the team and he used to occasionally just throw these into his team talk and he turned to this guy and said John Melina Melina explain what Melina is and um, so he was you know it's the, basically the idea that you've got the lead you manage the lead you're trying to play out for the result and maybe you know some sideways passing um, defensively but it, it became farcical because we'd actually get distracted because when we were maybe one nil up towards the end of the game he'd be shouting from the sideline Melina Melina and we'd all completely lose our focus ironically we'd, we'd be more likely to concede. The other one he had was cattiveria agonistica, which is a really sort of over elaborate Italian term, which is the equivalent of basically put your foot in. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. it's basically competitive aggression is the is the best translation for that. But uh, you must have really enjoyed discovering these terms, Tom. Oh, completely. And I think I think the great thing with Melina is that once you understand what it means, um, it it makes sort of perfect sense in terms of the sort of heritage of Italian football and, and goes back to what we were talking about previously about Catenaccio, this idea that, you know, the Italians are masters, uh, the Italians are masters at taking the sting out of a game. And it, it's something that I'm conscious of, um, even sort of playing football at the very low level that, that, that I play it at, you know, sort of amateur football, Sunday league football, British teams, we don't have that culture of Melina, um, you know, even if a team is is winning quite comfortably, our football DNA just impels us all to continue just like flooding forwards, trying to score. That you know, uh, and I think this is probably you know, this is probably changing. I mean, the average uh, the average sort of youth football team in the UK these days is probably much more sophisticated than it was you know when I was playing kids football. But it's um, you know. It, the the existence of, of a phrase like Melina makes perfect sense in the context of Italian football because how many times do you see Italian teams doing that and you know I sort of think back to my first experience of watching um, European football on TV in, in the early to mid 90s and like, you know, the great Juventus team of, of that time and how good they were at just shutting down games and, and seeing teams like that come up against you know, Man United or Blackburn Rovers or whoever it was at the time, and just realising there was this sort of like level of, of tactical know-how that, that that didn't exist in in British football. And I think even 
Now, even today, you, you know, if you watch a group of lads in their 30s playing five a side, th there is just this inbuilt reluctance to knock the ball back to your goalkeeper, you know, to just look after the ball for a bit, take the sting out of the game, tire out the opposition. Um, there, there's just this sense that any pass that isn't a forward pass is some form of sport and cowardice, you know, and cannot be tolerated at all. Um, and yeah, I guess in that in that context, Melina sort of stands at you know the complete opposite side of that that spectrum and that that conception of football. I want one final. I've got one final question to ask you before I do that. Um, talk to me about the success of the book because I understand it's uh, it's being translated into several languages. Yeah, and that's been really exciting, and it, it's. It's been fascinating as well um, to see this book that is all about foreign languages now being translated into, into foreign languages. So it's been translated into French and German so far. Um, and as a French speaker, I've you know, been able to read the, the French version and, and, and you know, took a lot of pleasure doing that. And, uh, but then I'm not a German speaker. Uh, so leafing through the German uh, version was, you know, was, was 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 interesting, uh, but in a different way to the French version. Um, it's being translated into Polish, uh, and I think the initial plan was that it would be released in Polish at some point this year. Not entirely sure um, whether that's still the case, but at some point there'll there'll be a Polish version. Um, and there's been talk of a Japanese version as well, um, but that will be that will be further down the line. Um, and yeah, I think I think in, in the UK it's it's sold reasonably well. Uh, and, you know, the, the nicest thing about it, about the whole process, and I think this is true of anyone who writes a book, has been just sort of getting random messages on Twitter, on Instagram. You know, uh, the summer after it came out, I had people sending me pictures of them sort of sitting by the pool, sitting on the beach. And, um, it you know, it occurs to you when you write a book. And I remember receiving my first copy of the book and, it's a very you know, nerve wracking thing. Um, and it occurs to you uh, once you receive that first copy of the book that from that point on, you're no longer the only person who has any sort of relationship with it. It no longer solely belongs to you. It goes out into the world and people buy it and they develop a relationship with it. Some people love it, some people hate it, some people you know, might, be, <laughs> might feel quite ambiguous towards it. But um, yeah, that's been really nice and, and you know, sort of getting getting messages from people in different countries and, um, you know, football fans and, 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 and people who love language as well. Um, and, and that's been, yeah, that's been, that's been the nicest thing about it. I think that's, that's the thing that struck me the most is, is the sort of global appeal that it has. It is quite niche, but it's still of interest to football fans and language lovers. As you said, it's also a serious academic exercise. You know, you said you wanted to, to have fun with it, but equally a lot of research has gone into it. There's clearly a huge cultural understanding as well of the significance of these terms. Before we finish, um, do you have a podium of top three terms from the book off the top of your head? Ooh, a podium. Okay, I'm going to go with uh, Where the Owl Sleeps from... Uh, Brazilian Portuguese, Onde Dorme a Coruja. That was one of the first terms that I came across when I was researching the Brazil chapter. Um, and Brazil is one of the first chapters in the book because um, it starts in starts in South America. Um, and that I think it's just such a it's a sort of a classic example of the sort of the sort of thing that I was looking for when I researched the book. And I, and I think it 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 speaks to the the lyricism that is such a fundamental part of. Um, of the way that you know Brazil looks at football. Um, another one that I love from Kenya, uh, Kukanyaga Nioka, which is a Swahili term which translates as to step on a snake. Uh, and a player steps on a snake or is said to have stepped on a snake when they take a swing at the ball uh, and miss. So they, they <laughs> uh, and what I love about that is that it it's a very um, it's a very vivid metaphor, uh, but it only really makes sense in a Kenyan context. You know, you're not liable to encounter a snake anywhere near a football pitch in, you know, an awful lot of countries where football is played. But in Kenya, that is, uh, you know, uh, a risk. Um, so I've, I've always really liked that one. And then there's one from the Netherlands. And I, I think the, the chapter on Dutch football is, is one of my favourite in the book, because I think the Dutch have such a sort of 
unique conception of football uh, and a real kind of like intellectual conception of football that I, I don't think has an equivalent anywhere else. Uh, and there's an awful lot of Dutch terms that I really enjoy, but one that always makes me smile is Vrouwen uh, uh, and Kinderen eerst, which means women and children first. And it's the sort of thing you might hear a Dutch TV commentator shout out when the ball is bouncing around the penalty area and none of the defenders can clear it just to create this sort of general sense of panic <laughs> evoking you know a sinking ship and, and people sort of flooding towards the lifeboats you know that famous scene in titanic uh, and there's there's a lot of that sort of humor in in um in the language of dutch football so yeah that's that's one that always raises a smile as well absolutely fantastic and um Congrats on the pronunciation as well. It sounded very authentic, that Dutch accent as well. Thanks again then to Tom for speaking to me. I thought there was some really interesting insight in our conversation. I'm sure you'll agree. And if you haven't already, why not pick up a copy of Do You Speak Football? In the meantime, I'm going to go off and prepare another video. And I suggest you click the like button on this one. Cheers.